Media. This is an account of joint work with Alison Pease, who's sitting at the back there. Um, and uh, I work at Queen Mary University of London, which is about two miles east of here. Um, but I'm currently on sabbatical at Edinburgh. So, oh, the mathematical culture is an issue. Um, I'm just uh, very intrigued by this and intrigued to find, see what, what, what's going to emerge over the course of the next three days. Um, the place I've come from is perhaps a different place from some people. A bit about me. I started out life as an honest God group theorist. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in Cambridge in England, and then I did a PhD at the University of Warwick. The University of Warwick, for people who don't know um, the UK research math scene, had a very, had and has a very exciting <coughs> math department. Tony and I, which Tony Dodd and I were just talking about this earlier on. Tony was there right at the start of it in the late 60s. I was at Gunderton, Tony. I was there when it sort of got going um, a bit further in the, in the late 70s. Um, but we had this amazing initiative in the UK in the late 60s. A lot of new universities were founded um, uh, and Warwick chose to specialise in mathematics and it put together a superb mathematics department. Kristen uh, Zeman, some of you may have heard of, Tony was reminding me, a sort of cajoled, persuaded, bribed the best <laughs> young mathematicians from all over the world to come and work for him in Warwick and start this radically new and exciting math department. Of course, one of the reasons it was radically new and exciting was it wasn't hidebound by the traditions of Oxford and Cambridge. You could do things in a new and different way. Um, so I worked as a group theorist, um, working on things to do with automorphisms of people. Well, never mind, don't they? Mm. If you do it, it's one of the most incredibly exciting things if you go um, I only just discovered this morning, thanks to Googling it, that it was number eight in the top 25 hottest articles in the Journal of Algebra, April to June 2007. <laughs> it's quite possible the Journal of Algebra only published nine articles. <laughs> I don't know, but the leap tables are everything. That's certainly something that's changed since I started my, I started my PhD. Um, um, but I've also, more recently, I moved into computer science in the 1980s, when there were no jobs in mathematics in the UK. Um, and I became, uh, I started to work in the field of computer check proof. Um, What's that all about? Well, it's the endeavour of getting computers to produce formal proofs. Ah, Russell and Whitehead. Russell and Whitehead, of course, did not have a computer to check all this. Um, it is uh, volume 2, page 79 of Principia Mathematica, where <coughs> we finally learn something useful. <laughs> um, we possibly learn that Russell and White has a sense of humour, but I would like to be <laughs> um, Actually, the, the hero, or possibly heroine of this, of this thing, has been Russell and White his typesetter. I mean, they didn't type it set it themselves, did they? Somebody was sitting there in the bowels of Cambridge, I presume Cambridge University Press, typesetting this stuff. <laughs> Um, I, I produced this slide at another meeting, and somebody pointed out to me something I hadn't quite realised before, which was that in the early days of this computer checked proof monarchy, somebody did start to put into a computer a uh, Principia Mathematica, and Russell was still alive. <laughs> um, I think this must have been the late 60s, I think when Russell died. Anyway, it was, it was the late 60s. But apparently, Russell. Uh, was in contact with, with whoever it was and, uh, and said, well, you know, nice, nice piece of work, which we've been able to do it that way, or worse to that effect. But it's one of those things where you suddenly go, gosh, I've never thought of that. Um, well, it would be a whole other lecture, and um, also interesting, but from the point of view of mathematical cultures, to um, talk about where that endeavour has got to. Uh, there's been significant investment in it by companies like Intel, um, 
because they want to be absolutely certain that their floating point calculations are correct, and these are not the kinds of proofs that anybody is going to want to do about data. You know, all the things that, and we had another discussion, you talk about being desirable in the development of mathematics or mathematical proofs don't really necessarily apply to this stuff, which is just big and boring, so for example. Um, but there's also been uh, work in mainstream mathematics, most particularly Fleischbeck, which is Tom Hale's formalization of the proof of the Kepler projection, which is pretty nearly done. So that's a whole endeavor of mathematical <coughs> practice, and if you want to know a lot more about it, you can go read the wonderful book by Donald McKenzie called Mechanizing Proof. Um, how did I come to think about mathematical practice? Well, I've been working, as I say, in this sort of area for some time. And I began to realize that although we, um, we like to think that it was having a huge impact on the culture of mathematical research, actually it isn't really. Um, Tom Hales went off and got to grips for this formal proof because he's the kind of person he is and he really wanted reassurance of this proof of the Kepler conjecture, but most mathematicians don't. Most mathematicians, as will be um, you know, familiar to you or rehearsed perhaps in other talks at this meeting, most mathematicians don't go down as far as this in, in trying to do their mathematics for all um, reasons you might guess. Um, and so I started thinking about mathematical practice because I started thinking about, well, okay, we've got all this stuff. We've invested in the computer science community a lot of time and energy in producing these machines that could be formal proof. Um, what more would we need to do to actually make it useful, make this stuff useful to mainstream research mathematicians? And so I started thinking from that kind of perspective, I suppose, of you know, how does research mathematics advance? What is it that research mathematicians do? All the kinds of questions that are very much in, uh, in the thinking of the, the, the mathematical cultures. And then in particular, can computers help? Could a computer be a mathematician? Um, and what's the future of using, the, using computers, using the internet in other ways to support mathematics, like crowdsourced maths? So, here's a whole other dimension of impact for the next round. <laughs> there is a question online, too, but you will be coming to this later on. And this is Aunt Helen Hacken's proof, so so-called proof. Oh, well, look, rather, than, proof. rather than attempt to answer it, can I suggest you read the relevant chapter of Donald McKenzie's book? Okay. Um, yeah, that, I mean, there is a, we could, we could spend all day talking about the Helen Hacken so. In the course of um, in the course of my, uh, my mathematical career, I actually spent two years in the Van Champagne at the time when they had this wonderful postmark for all colours suffice. <laughs> um, okay, this was a Facebook meme, uh, courtesy of uh, one of my teenage nieces a few weeks ago. What do mathematicians do? Um, etc. etc. What society thinks I do, what I think I do, what I do, do etc. Um, so, but what do mathematicians do? Or what do research mathematicians do? Well, of course, in your dreams, um, um, we have yeah, Andrew Wilde. You know, <coughs> devote 30 years of our lives to produce truly Fermat's last theorem. Um, in your manager's dreams, <laughs> I want to mention Peter Cameron a little while ago. In your manager's dreams, um, well, you're a machine that earns money for the university by doing the right things. Um, um, this is what we don't do, really, as I just said. Um, we have philosophical approaches to what mathematicians do. Um, uh, we have sociological approaches to approach mathematical practice to <coughs> mathematicians. Um, what, what thinking about what mathematicians do? Um, this is as, as, as 
um, legal theory of assault, assault. This is a kind of interdisciplinary endeavor thinking about what and all of this, uh, all of where, where I'm coming from, is, is production of research mathematics without even getting into teaching um, mathematics or engineering mathematics or cool stuff that turns people onto mathematics like pseudocodes. Um, um, I had a conversation, I didn't, I, I've just come back from holiday in Turkey, I speak no Turkish, but nonetheless I was able to bond with a Turkish lady on the plane because we were both doing the pseudoco. And we, we managed to communicate by sign language that this was a worse addiction than Swedish. <laughs> 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 it was quite <quite> amusing. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, just a number of perspectives on what mathematicians do. Um, so, what the the the, the, the take that I have, the thing that I started thinking about, is what mathematical what we can learn from mathematical practice on the internet. Um, now, there's really been there really is an enormous amount of mathematical activity on the internet of, of, of different kinds. I only really discovered quite how much when I had the misfortune to be stuck at home ill for rather a long time. And um, when you're stuck at home ill, you spend far too much time on the internet. And I realised that you could spend an enormous amount of time on the internet reading about mathematics. Um, and this provides us with an enormous number of sources for mathematical ethnography, sociology, study of mathematical practice, whatever you, whatever you would like to call it. Um, after all, you know, ethnography has practiced, what do you need to practice ethnography properly? Well, you need to find somebody who's motivated enough to spend their, their energies, their passion for ethnography or sociology when they could be studying any community in the world doing anything want to study this strange community of research mathematicians and hang around in math conferences or math conferences or something. Well, it's, a, you know, it's quite an ask, really. Um, uh, but now, what you have, what you have is, is, uh, these amazing resources which I'm going to tell you about, which allow you to do mathematical ethnography for your tutorial. So, what we start? Well, I just want to talk about a few of them resources today. Um, because one of the things that rather strikes me is that uh, there are endeavours out there called things like web science or um, uh, computer supported cooperative work or you know all sorts of computer science things studying how to do things on the internet. The mathematical community has just gone away and done it. Um, you know, they haven't paid much attention to all this stuff. They've just gone away and worked out what works for them. And it's actually Really quite impressive when you stop thinking about it. This is the site that I'm sure many of you used. It's the History of Math site at St Andrews, which actually started before the internet, for those of us old enough to remember the olden days. It started as a hypercard stack. Who's old enough to remember hypercard stacks? Well, a few people it started. So this is before the web. There was hyper, the idea of hypertext. Uh, so, and this is um, a wonderful site, still maintained by Ed Robertson for the panel. Oh, is it as efficient as various other useful things? Uh, quotes of the day. Well, what is a quote of the day? Um, math Synet, Math Reviews. Um, um, math Reviews is the American Math Society. Um, puts, um, puts, it used to be, it used to be Big fat books that now all well, online produces reviews of every math paper um, ever published. And one of the things math reviews is most useful for is providing you with a definitive big text source of, <laughs> for um, papers. Now, those of us who are practicing mathematicians take these two resources absolutely for granted, but not every discipline has them. And computer science doesn't have anything like this. Um, <laughs> Other, other disciplines don't have these things. 
Of course, there have been mathematical data sources, the Atlas, based at Birmingham and now Queen Mary, tells you all you ever want to know about finite simple groups, what the name might be. Um, if you want to... Um, um, you can have online instruction. You can go to a... Um, you can go to a... do an online course um, taught by Keith Devlin at uh, Stanford. Learn how to think the way mathematicians do. Um, a powerful cognitive process developed over thousands of years. Keith Devlin at work. Um, the goal of the course is to help you develop a valuable method mental ability, a powerful way of thinking that our ancestors developed their mental etc. etc. I just found that one yesterday. Um, but another thing that's, that, that's happened is um, a number of very senior mathematicians have become very visible and prolific bloggers. Um, this is uh, Tim Gowers, Sir Tim Gowers, um, mathematician in Cambridge, he was met a few years ago. Um, one of the things he's been, he, he, he's a very influential blogger, um, he's been heavily involved in the anti Elsevier movement. Um, am I allowed to mention? <laughs> Best not mention. Hello, walls of the London Mathematical Society debates about mathematical publishing. However, <laughs> Tim, oh, yes. Tim Gowers has been very influential in that. Um, and, um, uh, this is a um, uh, this, this is a this is a, a blog post. I call that pair of blog posts you produced during the last ICM, which I went um, the last International Congress of Mathematicians. Um, he's blogging about a lecture he's attending, which is meant to be a popular account of the work of somebody which has been awarded with a Fields Medal. And um, I, I, I uh, it, it, it would take me too far off track to spend a long time talking about this. But what's rather striking about this is that he's live blogging this talk. Here we have Fields Medalist Tim Gowers, one of the smartest research mathematicians on the planet. He's sitting there blogging away, and then he says, basically, I was following this for about half an hour, and then I got lost. <laughs> and actually, you read this, and you think, you know, when I was a young mathematician, I wish somebody told me it was OK to get lost in lectures. <laughs> And that even really, really clever senior people got lost in lectures. <laughs> and so the, the role of, of this kind of blogging activity in, in creating a culture, <coughs> creating a community, I think is quite is quite striking. You know, for good or for bad. But, but there's something there's something happening here about <laughs> the fact that, that individuals are just prepared to put themselves on the line like that. You know, I, I suppose that I don't know whether that that's a a universal of mathematical culture, or whether it comes down to particular individuals, you know, happen to be around now in Bobby Law, but um, quite striking. Terry Tao is another eminent mathematician who also blogs a lot. Both of these guys, as far as I can see, particularly Tao seems to clone himself. The, the amount they manage to blog while doing everything else they do, and both of them having several small children, you know, it's just sort of Um, but the blogging community is also changing, uh, you know, changing the dynamic of, of some mathematical discussions um, quite significantly. Um, try something with this when I That's better, yes. Um, some of you may recall in the summer um, a couple of years ago there was a claim. Um, by a mathematician who worked at IBM called um, De Donicard, who pr proved that P not equal to MP, which had it been, had he proved that, would have been a huge um, mathematical achievement. Now, what would have happened with this proof in the olden days, pre-internet? Well, he would have written it up, he would have posted it by mail to a few friends, or he would have sent it to the referee, you know, in a few period of mature reflection. Um, instead, what happened was, he, he, it, it, it got out, he later claimed that far more people had got hold of it than he'd ever intended. And there was immediately um, a discussion in the blog space, um, you know, P not equal to MP proof is one week old. Um, 
and after um, a number of very eminent people, including uh, Jim Litton, who posts this, this um, blog and, and thought about it, the conclusion was that, well, the approach, the, the general approach might have something in it, the, the, um, the, the two main holes in, in the proof to present it, for to do the resources and the proof as presented. They're, they're Back the, the paper. And this is a very different change, to, it's quite a change to the dynamic of mathematical research. Um, you know, not just eminent, not just famous results like that, but these days typically if you produce a result in mathematics, you stick it up on the archive, other people can have a look at it, other people can comment on it. Um, and um, we had a little discussion meeting about aspects of this in Edinburgh in April, and one of the mathematicians there. Um, pointed out that actually this has completely changed debates about priority um, and also you know whether it's a good thing or, or a bad thing but it, it's changed you know because people put stuff online it's out there um, uh, you know, no, 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 no argument about it and, and also that people can't really claim to be uh, you know it's much less likely that people will be aware of other relevant work in the, in the field. You know, in the olden days, it was sort of nightmare to grab you. would be you slogging away at something for two years, and then you'd find somebody else that done the same thing. Um, these days, you're much more sharing of information, you're much less likely to find that. This might make you more cautious about, you know, <coughs> change the dynamic in other ways as well. But that's a big change that we to the rest of the talk, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of issues one can pull out around all these sites, but for the rest of the talk, I want to concentrate on two things that Alison and I particularly looked at um, from this perspective of finding out about how mathematics is done on the internet and thinking about how the computer techniques that we have might support that and make it more um, the first is um, a site called Math Overflow. Uh, Math Overflow is a mathematical question answering system. Um, basically, well, it's very straightforward what it does. He posts your question, um, and then there's a discussion, um, there are answers, there are ratings, and so on. Um, and the point about this. Um, from the point of view of, of, of trying to do ethnography, is here you have um, vast numbers of mathematical questions and answers sitting there, or vast numbers of mathematical conversations sitting there, um, which you can analyze. And then the other one is. Uh, ah, I closed it. That wasn't very clever, was it? Um, Using everything I've been searching, it's everything I've been searching for. Um, Tripadvisor, Tripadvisor, Tripadvisor. Very polymath. And the other thing is, um, uh, is polymath. Um, Polymath is an approach to proof organized by uh, um, Terry Tao. Um, the idea of polymath is that a question is posted on the web and it's solved by um, it's solved by people collaborating and discussing on the web, showing all their working and then trying to come into an answer. So um, the PowerPoint. Um, what can we what can we learn from these things? Well, let's start with polymath. Um, polymath can be viewed in the framing of citizen science or collaborative science or 
crowdsource science. Um, the idea, as I said, is to um, is to organise a number of organise a number of people to help them produce a proof, mathematical proof, collaboratively. Now, nothing new there. I'm sure they, the things that you were talking to us about before lunch were collaborative productions in, in some way. We don't, know, we don't know how, but they were. Um, 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 nothing nothing new, there, new there. But, uh, but what, what particularly is new about this is, is the way that it's been done quite is that the process is being thought through rather carefully in order to stimulate and encourage collaboration, in order to keep many people involved, and in order to make sure that all the routes, all the, um, all the different steps in the group, all the different steps in the conversation are, um, are documented. Uh, so, um, this is um, one of the significant results that they had. Um, they, they Produced in this, this way, a new proof of the density of Taylor Stewart theorem. Note the name of the author, um, D. H. J. Density of Taylor Stewart. <laughs> um, 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 and this is um, this is one of the polymath problems that Alison and I decided to look at in a bit more detail. Um, what we did was to take um, what uh, Terry Power calls a mini polymath problem, analyzing the whole proof of the density held during the period, which, which took place over several years, would be a major endeavor, for which we would need a research group. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, this, was, this was something smaller than we could do in a, in a few minutes. Um, so, here's the problem, as we uh, showed you a second ago. Um, and, uh, can you read that at the back? Oh, yes. Good. Well, it depends on putting on glasses. Yes. Well, the idea... Lots of in the middle. Sorry. Parallel the front. How do we zoom on this? Is it not... Yes. Thank you.